the SEAL's primary theaters of operation are rivers and oceans. Most other special operations forces are land or air-based. Those that do get their feet wet are just hitching a ride. For the SEALs, water is home. They use it to their advantage for concealing infiltration and extraction. The SEALs' waterborne missions are an inheritance from their ancestors. A small group of Navy swimmers who formed the underwater demolition teams. There is one direct line of ancestors to today's Navy SEALs. Every SEAL who has ever been owes his existence to the underwater demolition teams. The underwater demolition teams were organized after one of the costliest invasions of the Pacific War, the assault of Tarawa in November 1943. Where the U.S. Marines lost more men due to drowning before they ever reached the beach. Why did they lose so many men? They didn't know how deep the water was. They didn't know where the coral heads were. They didn't know where the obstacles were. Lacking crucial operational intelligence, Higgins boats packed with Marines grounded hundreds of yards offshore. Nevertheless, they pressed the attack. When the men piloting the landing craft dropped the ramps and said, get out, Marines stepped out into water over their heads. Laden with weapons and equipment, they sank like rocks. They drowned long before ever facing the enemy. The high price paid in blood at Tarawa galvanized senior Navy officers into action. Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner, who had planned the operation at Tarawa, swore that he would not see that happen again. He looked for the men who could examine the beaches. He looked for men who could go into the water and find the obstacles. Admiral Turner found these men in an elite Navy team trained in the use of explosive charges. They were called Navy Combat Demolition Units. These were men who were chosen for a very, very specific mission. That mission was to blow open the beaches of Fortress Europe. On D-Day in June 1944, NCDU teams landed on the Normandy beaches. Under heavy fire, they set off demolition charges, blowing up obstacles that weighed tons. From the ranks of these men who would become D-Day heroes, Admiral Turner recruited the Navy's new underwater demolition teams, or UDTs. Whereas the NCDUs operated from boats run up onto shore, the UDTs were combat swimmers, dropped by boats offshore to conduct underwater reconnaissance and obstacle demolition. An ambitious task for which they were very lightly equipped. We had bathing suits, knives, life preservers, and a face mask. That's basically it. They went into combat almost naked but the UDTs could deliver an awesome punch. They used the Hagensen Pack, a small bag containing high explosives used for destroying coral outcrops and beach defenses. Hagensen was the name of a Navy lieutenant who devised a pack which held eight blocks of tetratol, each block weighing two and a half pounds, so the pack carried 20 pounds of explosive. To detonate, the tetratol needed to be ignited with Primacord, an explosive cord that burnt at 3,000 feet per second. A good length of safety fuse attached to the Primacord ensured that the UDTs had enough time to escape the Hackinson Pack's huge explosion. You always wanted to be pretty sure and attach a little more safety cord than you really thought it might take you. The explosions usually set up a plume of water three to 400 feet high. The concussion would be felt even a 1,000 feet away. Across the Pacific Theater, UDT teams surveyed beach landing zones from under the water, blew channels through rock and coral, and destroyed beach defenses. 
Their actions sealed the success of Marine Corps beach assaults right up to the invasion of Okinawa in April 1945. After seeing action in Korea during the 1950s, the UDTs were scaled down. But new enemies lay just over the horizon, ones that will require the United States to rethink its methods of waging war. These enemies were the communist guerrillas. The guerrilla was a new enemy, one that couldn't be hit by fire and maneuver, the traditional methods used by major land forces. To combat these forces, President Kennedy declared that America would have its own unconventional forces. In the Navy, the unconventional forces were the Navy SEALs. President Kennedy officially commissioned the SEALs in 1962. SEAL stood for Sea, Air, and Land. Their mission, to fight hostile unconventional forces on the ground wherever they might be in the world. Like their ancestors in World War II, the newly formed SEALs would have to operate and survive in water. To carry out missions from beneath the surface, they adopted rebreathers. Rebreathers allow a diver to breathe underwater. They work like a simple recycling system. When the diver exhales, his breath goes into a canister containing a lime-based chemical. The lime scrubs the carbon dioxide from the breath, converting it back to oxygen. The recycled air is topped off with a small amount of oxygen stored in a compressed gas cylinder, making it available for the diver to breathe again. In essence, it's an extension of the lung, and he rebreathes his own air, utilizing the soft lime material inside the canister. And the most important part about it is there's no exhale of bubbles or no external bubbles come out of the system. Rebreathers have a distinct stealth advantage over open circuit systems, where the diver breathes compressed gases. Open circuit systems vent large amounts of bubbles into the water, but rebreathers release very few. Bubbles breaking the surface of the water are the telltale sign to any sentry that a submerged swimmer is approaching. If you're standing on a pier or on deck of a ship, and you see bubbles come up alongside the ship, you know you got a swimmer in the water. You scream out, swimmer in the water. Swimmer in the water! People that heard it would start grabbing a hand grenade. And if you've ever been to water, when a small hand grenade goes off, it's like sticking an egg beater up your butt and putting a wild man on a crank it will bring you to the surface. The use of rebreathers for special operations began in World War II, when they were adopted by the OSS Maritime Unit. For underwater sabotage deep behind enemy lines, rebreathers were a crucial part of the OSS arsenal. The dive gear they chose then with the Lambertson Amphibious Respiratory Unit. Considered outstanding in its day, the Lambertson Rebreather was not without its problems. I damn sure am glad this was not around in my day. You notice with the size of that face mask, you didn't have very much visibility. In the earlier models, you could get a CO2 buildup, which would black you out. It's just like uh, put a paper bag over your head You'll black out, and you never know you went out. After World War II, Lambertson's design principles were refined and improved. When commissioned in 1962, the SEALs adopted these second-generation rebreathers for creeping up on enemy ships and shorelines. Today, the SEALs use the latest rebreather design, the LAR-5. It guarantees their invisibility to the enemy and allows them to swim longer and further than ever before. The system's designed for long, clandestine methods of entry, especially for when the operator gets close to a danger zone. No one will know they're there. No bubbles, no trouble. 